God says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Aren't you glad for headlights in a car at night? I love being able to see where you're going. Once my wife lost her voice. For an entire day, she could not speak, even above a whisper. Now, I know her voice after 42 years more than any other voice. So it was enjoyable for one day, but life would be a bit unbearable if it were forever. Be kind of tragic. Where there is love and relationship, there are always words. Two kids get in love, get on the phone, Lord God, they can talk forever. Words, words. So I'm asking the question this morning, does God have a voice? Does God speak? This is the third in our series called Core Beliefs of Christianity. What are the non-negotiables, the essentials? And there aren't that many. We looked in lesson one, we looked at grace alone. No works, but by grace we are saved. Number two, we looked at Jesus alone. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved. Jesus only, by himself. And today we're talking about the Bible alone as God's authoritative word. The Reformers called it sola scriptura, or scripture alone, the Bible alone. The Bible says all authority belongs to God. Now, the Bible never claims to have all authority. Jesus said all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So when we talk about the authority of the Bible, that's shorthand for talking about the authority of God. When we say the Bible has authority, we mean God uses the Bible to express his authority and his truth. The authority of the Old Testament was recognized by the people of Israel and by Jesus. Jesus said, don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets, all that Old Testament. He said, I came to fulfill it. And then we have books in the New Testament. There is a myth that the New Testament books were arbitrarily chosen in the 4th century by Emperor Constantine. However, by the 4th century, the books that would become the New Testament were already circulating throughout the Roman Empire and were widely recognized as having authority. The early church believed those writings could be traced back to Jesus' disciples, and the church believed those writings were consistent with the known teaching and life of Jesus. They were uh, irrefutable. A century before Constantine, that's a hundred years, a church father named Origen wrote, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the only undisputed ones in the whole church of God throughout the world. So the canonization or the putting together of all these letters into the Bible, they were acknowledged simply something that everybody already knew and already recognized. It wasn't a surprise. A great Edinburgh professor named William Barclay put it this way. It is the simple truth to say that the New Testament books became canonical or put into the Bible because nobody could stop them from doing so. Now, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that all God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Bible is authoritative because it has been uniquely inspired and breathed out by God. Now, I need your grace here. Out of these core beliefs, this is a tough one to do in a quick, a quick message on Sunday. This one is tough, believe me. I have edited and re-edited, and I'm going to do 180 words a minute to try to make something complex as simple as I know how. And I'm sure if you listen at all, you'll learn something that you didn't know. It's important to understand not just what the Bible is, but what it is not. Now, the Bible is not primarily a book of commands or doctrines, although they're in there. It is not an owner's manual for Christian living. My car has an owner's manual. An owner's manual is not a book you read for recreation. Hello. Most of you never opened one in your car either. You use an owner's manual to find out how to fix what's broken. So a lot of people think the Bible operates like an owner's manual. It does not. What should I do when I have doubts? Page 32. 
What is the right belief about the end times? Uh, page 816. Have you ever noticed the Bible's not arranged like that? People get confused and frustrated when they recognize it does not function as a manual. Furthermore, the Bible does have commands and does have doctrine, but it's not mostly that. It is basically a story from the start to the finish of God's plan. Now, part of the doctrine of inspiration involves a belief the Bible is primarily a story because God chose it to be a story. There are good reasons for it. Stories carry authority, and if you don't understand that, you won't understand the Bible. During World War II, my father fought in the war. Military soldiers had to follow a lot of commands. There were a lot of beliefs tied to the war. Who's on the right side? What's good? What is freedom? What's the right strategy? So on 10 Downing Street in London was a bow tie wearing, cigar chomping, scotch drinking prime minister named Winston Churchill. I don't care what you think, I like him. He told a story, and I'm going to quote his speech. You can Google it. Upon this battle against Germany, World War II, upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. If we stand, all Europe may be free, and the life of the world may move forward into broad sunlit uplands. But if we fail, the whole world and all we have known and cared for will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. Let us therefore so bear ourselves that if the British Empire lasts a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest hour. Wow. And people responded, I'll give my life for that, they said. Now, of course, he told this story eloquently, but it wasn't the artistry of the words that mattered. It was the reality of the story. What he said was absolutely true. All kinds of commands, beliefs, and regulations would be part of that story, but they only make sense if you get the story. And one of our rival statements today in postmodernism is that there is no great story. It's all random. You and I have no meaning or purpose. We're just random specks. But the Bible says there is a story, and it's your story. It's my story. And our stories are part of a bigger story, the Bible story. And if you miss that, you're going to miss your story. Dr. Tom Wright says it's helpful to think about the story of the Bible like a play. Anybody but me ever been to a play? Well, a play. That was brilliant, right? Okay. And been to a NASCAR race or something? Okay. Well, in a play, they have acts, right? Act one, act two, act three. It's, it's a story, but it's divided into different acts in a play. So the Bible has a trajectory. Uh, it's important to know what the acts are and where we belong in that story. So the best I can, here we go. Act one, not acts. This is not the book of acts. Act one is creation. Genesis 1, verse 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God made all creation. He loves creation. He especially loves Texas. But, okay, I got you back. But he loves all of creation because he made it. They loved, he loved the mountains, the sunset, the, the, the beach. We've, we've all seen those beautiful, they, they, we say, oh man, this is so great. Yeah, it's great because God made it and he made it good. And we learn all about that creation in Act 1. Ah, but that's not the whole story. That was just Act 1. Here's Act 2, the fall. Act 2 runs throughout most of the Bible, but especially in Genesis chapter 3 through chapter 11. And because of the fall of Adam, oppression, murder, violence, and injustice flood into our world. Marriage gets messed up. Adam and Eve start to fight. A man named Lamech becomes a murderer and the first polygamist. The institution of family is now corrupted. Cain kills his brother Abel. And it tells us in Act chapter 2, life on earth is not the way God intended it to be. I get tired of hearing God get blamed for all the violence and murder. Let me tell you who's to blame. Adam. Adam disobeyed God and we had a perfect world till Adam decided not to do what God said. And you're going to find out that when God speaks, the enemy speaks. And when God told Adam and Eve what to do, then the enemy showed up and says, has God said? I read in Vanity Fair. I heard Britney Spears say, well, my, my friends say words. 
But he said, has God said, he doesn't really mean, baby, what he said. Don't pay any attention to him. He doesn't know what's best for you. And that's the first attack of Satan in the Bible against God's word. Always. So this world is messed up because man messed it up. And there is no ideal world. There, there, there will be, but there isn't now. And these humanists say things are just what they are. There's no real story. But the story of the Bible tells us the world was designed with a particular purpose. It was made perfect, but things are not the way they are supposed to be. There's a reason things are messed up, and it's not primarily because of ignorance or lack of progress in education and technology. This world can't be fixed politically by education or technology. The world is broken because of human sin, because of what happened in Act 2, because of the human heart. And this is what we learn in Act 2. I'm reading out of Genesis 6, verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and every inclination of the thought of the human heart was only evil all the time. God didn't make that. Adam brought that. God didn't give Adam that kind of a heart. Adam chose in rebellion and got that, and it affects all of us and all of our thoughts. The Bible says we go astray from our mother's womb. Our little babies come out, they're pink, they're cute, they're precious, we love them, and they're liars. They're deceivers right out of the womb. God said that. They're born with that broken nature. Me, you, everybody. And it says, the Lord regretted that he made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. Okay, so now things are really screwed up. What's God going to do? How's he going to deal with his grief? How is he going to deal with the tragedy of the fall? Is he going to abandon the story? Is the story going to end in hopelessness? Nope. Now we move to Act 3. Act 3 begins with a little country called Israel. God did not give up on this main story. He takes a man named Abram. He changes his name to Abraham. God tells Abraham he's going to be the father of many nations. Now that's an important part of the story. This part of the story does not tell us God loves Israel more than anybody else. Instead, God is going to use Israel to reclaim all the people in creation that he loves. He loves everybody. God says, all the peoples of the earth, Abraham, will be blessed by you. So he starts with a little band of people, and he makes a covenant. I'll be your God. He gives them structure for worship because the world doesn't know God from a hole in the ground. And he gives them an identity and a way of life. But many people get confused by the law and by the culture. And they wonder, what's the deal with all these weird, strange laws in the Old Testament? Strange laws concerning food. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 29. Of the animals that move on the ground, these are unclean for you. The weasel, the rat, any kind of great lizard, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the wall lizard, the skink, and the chameleon. Now, a lot of you never heard of some of those animals, except the gecko, for sure. And then there's some other strange ones about cleanness and uncleanness. Leviticus 13, 40. When a man has lost his hair and is bald, he's clean. Well, Lord, who celebrates that? (laughs) Now, if God wanted Israel to obey these laws, why don't we have to obey them? Did God change his mind? Is our obedience selective? Deuteronomy 14, 10. Any creature in the water that does not have fins or scales, you may not eat. Now, I'm sure there are a whole lot of us in here that like to eat lobster or shrimp or crawfish. Ooh, Louisiana folks love them, but, man, they'll eat stuff you wouldn't walk on. God's Bible is pretty clear and common sense. Nothing tough about it. Because of Christ's work on the cross, our relationship to the law has now changed. A reformer named John Calvin said there are three categories of Old Testament laws. First, there are civil laws. Israel was a nation. They didn't have a separate constitution or a set of state laws. So part of the Old Testament contains laws about how Israel was supposed to function as a nation. There are regulations concerning property, court and legal sentencing, and and on and on. But since the people of God today are no longer restricted to one ethnic group or one nation, we don't have the same relationship to those sorts of laws as the people of Israel did. Calvin said the Old Testament also contains ceremonial laws that's worship proper sacrifices what's clean what's unclean but the sacrificial system of offering all those blood sacrifices anticipated the coming of jesus and his redemptive work at the cross 
And every one of them was fulfilled by Jesus' perfect sacrifice on the cross. Now, God had to walk them there through different acts. He couldn't get them there in one gigantic leap. Okay? God's anger towards sin and his love for sinners was expressed once and for all through Christ's death. And the Bible says now in the New Testament, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. No more. Now, so what are you working for? What are you trying to perform to earn God's approval? Well, I'm not going to eat that, and I'm not going to eat that. And I'll tell you in just a minute. He said you can eat dirt, worms, chocolate-covered ants if you want to. I'm, I'm just wondering, all these steeples and churches, what happened? See, my, my peers told me, read the Bible, it's God's Word. I did, and then they rebuked me. I says, you're not doing what it says. Oh, shut up, sit down, be quiet. Just do what we say. I won't do it, and I don't want you to do it. I want you to think why you do what you do. Now, it'd be unthinkable for us to go back to those old arrangements. If we did, we'd violate their purpose. There was a purpose. They will always be part of our story, but we live, we live in a different act. Jesus spoke in Mark 7, verse 18. He said, Do you not know that whatever goes into a person from outside doesn't defile him, since it doesn't enter his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? What comes out of a person is what defiles him. Thus, Jesus declared all foods clean. And how many of you know there are certain religions quite near us that have food and dietary laws? Certain foods are not good for you, but they don't make you unrighteous. If you eat too much bacon and pork, it'll clog your arteries. You might die five years before you should, but you don't die unrighteous. You die because you had too much pork, but it wasn't unrighteous. So just because we're not under that, don't eat so much pork, okay? It's not good. So... Jesus was saying, something's now about to happen through me and in me. He was explicitly declaring that dietary laws would no longer apply to his followers. Now, more than that, he was showing the categories of clean and unclean, which are important for Israel's development, and they existed to help people understand the concept of a clean heart. He had to use natural to show something spiritual. They couldn't understand it, so he'd use something natural. Once they understood that, then it's time for Jesus to usher in a new day. The Old Testament contains moral laws, like Deuteronomy 6, 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. Moral laws show us how people with clean hearts are supposed to live. So the Old Testament is not concerned primarily with mechanical legalism, Old Testament laws are concerned with people having a clean and an upright heart. And sometimes people mix this up that the Old Testament's just about legalism and the New Testament's just about grace, but both of them are concerned with the human heart. Jesus out of the heart are the issues of life. It's the heart, not my stomach. Out of the stomach come all of the issues of doctors. But out of the heart, and not meaning the organ that goes pump, pump, pump but the soul of a man. These are the issues of life. Now, here's a, here's a weird one. Deuteronomy 24, verse 20. When you beat the olives from your trees, don't go over the branch a second time. Now, how many of you think that sounds strange and irrelevant? It actually teaches compassion on the poor. Old Testament laws for, were for obedient hearts. And the reason farmers were told to leave olives on their trees, not just knock them all off, was so that the poor could get some of the leftovers. He said, don't take all the olives for yourself so you can get richer. Leave some for the poor who have limited resources. But what if you had fig trees? Well, the Bible only mentioned olive trees, so that principle doesn't apply to me. No, it applies to fig trees and orange trees and apple trees and every tree. It's an example that teaches us how to love others and how to have compassion on those less fortunate than us. So the law was never about narrow, legalistic, mechanical rule keeping. It was always about the heart. Now, some people say if the Bible is God's word, why did it allow practices like slavery and polygamy? See, many people in America 160 years ago used the Bible to defend slavery. People have the idea that, and I'm sad to say it, but they've used the Bible to defend murder and everything else. 
It's important to understand the nature of the Bible. The Bible is not like the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon, we're told, was given to Joseph Smith in one completed piece from heaven. It just descended on the earth with the rose-colored glasses. The Bible is not like that. The Bible is not a timeless set of principles that descended suddenly from heaven. It is not a generic, cultureless, timeless blueprint for social utopia. It was written by a particular people for a particular audience in a particular culture at a particular time. And God's going to use that to move people one step forward at a time. You need to understand that or you'll never understand the Bible. And you have to keep in mind the moral baseline of humanity after the fall. It was barbaric. It was horrible. Everybody did whatever they thought they was right and wanted to. Sometimes we think life is bad in our day, but we take for granted the civilizing influence of Christian ethics and practices throughout history and how it helped a barbaric world get better. The Bible was written in a barbaric age. Killing of infants was commonly practiced. Women were treated like possessions. Masters could kill slaves without any accountability at all. Religion was mostly superstitious. It, people didn't know God. Religion involved sometimes temple prostitutes and human sacrifices. So God started to work with people where they were so he could move them along to a better life one step at a time. So he starts in the ancient world, and in the ancient world, slavery was ubiquitous. There was no social safety net. There was no welfare system. If a man went into debt, selling himself, even his children, into slavery was the only means of survival. So a slave-free society was not an economic or social possibility. That was the world that the Bible was written in. That wasn't God's will. That was, that was the culture that the Bible was written in, and God's going to overturn it. But here's what the Old Testament did. It constantly limited and undermined the institution of slavery. The laws limited the power a master had over his slave. The law says a master cannot inflict punishment on a slave. It said slavery cannot be perpetual. After seven years, a master must free his slave. The master actually had to give financial resources to his slave. So we, un we need to understand that that sort of treatment of a slave did not occur anywhere in the world, but now in this little new country called Israel. So compared to the ancient culture, the Old Testament is constantly undermining the practice and power of slavery. And when you get to the New Testament, it's more pronounced. Paul wrote a letter to a man, Philemon, about his runaway slave, Onesimus. Put that on your football jersey. Onesimus. Paul told Philemon that instead of punishing his slave for running away, he should set him free. Paul said to the church in Galatia, this is Galatians 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That was unheard of in the ancient culture. Unheard of. Thomas Cahill, an author, says this is the first egalitarian statement in all of ancient literature. No pagan society had this thought, belief, or writing. And egalitarian simply means we're all equal. There, uh, I have equal rights. You have equal rights. But how many of you believe we had people in the pulpit preaching you don't have equal rights? In the South, they preached that a black man didn't have a soul. The stupid insanity around religion. All I wanted to be was a fighter pilot. I didn't want to be a preacher. I thought, Lord, you're going to have to dumb me down to be a preacher. I just don't want to do this. But I got drafted. What can I do? So at least have a little mercy on me. I'm trying. You know, this is tough stuff. So, over time, Christians looked at the trajectory of the Bible, how scriptures were now changing the barbaric ancient culture, and they realized slavery was not an expression of God's will if a human is going to flourish. It should be wiped out. So, guess what? The great anti-slavery movements were primarily led by Quakers and Methodists, people like John Wesley and William Wilberforce, and there were also similar dynamics around issues like polygamy and the treatment of women. So this doesn't mean I can finesse the Bible into saying whatever I want it to say or to justify sinful cultural trends. For example, 
Uh, our culture today is more sexually permissive than it has been in a hundred years. But if you study the Bible, the Old Testament was actually more restrictive than the culture it was written in. Sexual intimacy was to be reserved for the covenant of marriage. And I, I know that's called old-fashioned today, but it's old Bible. And God's never changed his mind. One, one book of one religion has been edited and redone 1,600 times. God says, heaven and earth will pass away. My word shall never pass away. God's never changed his mind about anything. Thank God we're under grace. Thank God we're under grace. But it still doesn't make it right. And it's not right. And so we've got more people that just live together without the covenant of marriage. And God says, look, that's not my will. That's not my perfect will. That's not the way the world is supposed to go around. Anyway, today it's pretty much, you know, hath God said, so I'll do what I want. Fine. So it's ironic people talk about sexual chastity as an old-fashioned idea. But it wasn't old-fashioned. It was a radical idea presented by God's Word, the Bible. So the Bible introduced a new concept to a sinful world. Now we move from Acts 3 to Act number 4. So we've gone from creation, we've gone from the fall, we've gone to the tiny nation of Israel. Now we come to Act 4, the life and ministry of Jesus. Now listen, when Jesus began his ministry, he used this phrase, the time is fulfilled. What does that mean? It means everything God's been doing in previous Acts has been leading up to Jesus and he's the climax. After Jesus' resurrection, he's talking with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. This is Luke 24, verse 27. And beginning with Moses and the prophets, Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Penta meaning five, the first five books of the, of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, Deuteronomy. And then the prophets, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all of those. So it says... And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures about himself. That word all is not that Jesus talked about a few messianic prophecies. Jesus explained to them that everything in the Old Testament led up to his life and his ministry. The whole story up to this point from Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, now Act 4 is all about him. It was always about him. So do you get what Jesus is saying? Everything, the whole story, creation, the fall, the nation of Israel, finally makes sense in the light of Jesus. And when we see phrases in the New Testament like according to the scriptures, we shouldn't think there are only a few isolated texts that have been fulfilled by Christ. These sayings imply the whole biblical story is about God's redemptive work in Jesus. And that brings us to our last act, act number five. Here comes the church. Now, that's the focus. Jesus ascends to the Father now in the resurrection. He sends his Holy Spirit. He sends his followers out on a mission to the whole world to proclaim good news of God's redemption and God's love for sinful humanity. And these people who went out to proclaim the good news loved the Old Testament. They knew how to interpret Act 1 through Act 4. And now they realize their place in Act 5. If you treat the Bible naively like a list of disconnected rules as though it was an owner's manual, you're not taking the Bible literally. You have to know the whole story. In April 1945, the German army surrendered to the Allies. The war continued, however. Japan was still fighting, even though Germany had surrendered. At this point, Allied soldiers who had been fighting against Germany began rebuilding Germany all during the same war. So imagine somebody looking back at World War II saying, well, that's odd. Sometimes Allied soldiers attack Germans, and sometimes they help Germans. I guess they just randomly pick and choose what they wanted to do. That's not literalism. That's stupidism. That sort of conclusions come because you didn't get the story. So we're in Act 5, not Act 3. Reading the Bible literally means you read it as the author intended for example, in Act 1, the creation story, it tells us the sun was created on day 4. Remember, ancient people were not stupid. Ancient people knew the sun was important to the day. If the writer was intending a day to mean one of our 24-hour planet rotations around the sun, then the writer probably would have included the sun in the story from the first day. 
But the writer's concern was primarily about theology, not the chronology of creation events. In the ancient Mesopotamia culture, a lot of people worship the sun. So part of what the writer is saying, don't worship the sun. The sun is not the creator, it's part of the creation. Worship the creator. So if you're going to read the Bible intelligently, understand it's not a blueprint from heaven outlining every fact about reality. The writer of Genesis is not writing with a scientific agenda to 21st century people. He's writing in a culture where people worship the sun. And instead, read the Bible like any other book. Try to discern what was the author's intent. And don't be quick to assume that scientific discoveries contradict the Bible. Now, we know the sun is the center of our solar system now, but Christians years ago said that couldn't be. They even put to death scientists and reformers who said that it wasn't true. It was heresy, and they killed people. And the basic reason was this scripture, the earth is set on its foundation and shall not be moved. So eventually the theory that the earth is round and rotates around the sun was proven to be correct. And many Christians agreed. They realized, bingo, the psalmist's point was about God's sovereignty, not astronomy. Sometimes in the church, in our concern for the Bible authority, we make hasty, dogmatic conclusions without thinking about what God was trying to communicate to us. Fortunately, in Act 5, we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus sent the same Spirit who who inspired Bible writers to illuminate Scripture to us. This is sometimes called the doctrine of illumination. I told you this was tough. Okay? You have no idea how good I feel about how I'm rocking on this thing right now, okay? If you think it's tough, you should see. So the two main doctrines in the Bible are the doctrine of inspiration of the Scripture and the doctrine of illumination, meaning that the Holy Spirit helps me understand it. This doesn't mean we don't have to study the Bible because we immediately, when we become a believer, get perfect understanding. I'm still learning. See, we're sinful. On our own, we tend to distort the Scriptures. The Apostle John wrote to the church where some people tried to lead others away from Jesus. He said, as for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anybody to teach you. That's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. Now, that, take that out of context, and it doesn't mean you don't have a, a teachers or a pastor to teach and lead. It is essential to what John meant. Don't let somebody who claims to have a special anointing distort the scriptures and lead you away from Jesus. Every Christian has received the Holy Spirit. Simply pray and read the Bible together with humility. The Holy Spirit is given to each Christian. That's why in the Protestant Reformation, people went to great lengths to translate the Bible into the common language of man so they could read it because they had hidden it away, chained it to a pulpit, written it in Latin, and nobody could understand it but the priest, and they made up rule. They just made up stuff and got away with it. It was called the Dark Ages. And so today you've got a free one in every hotel room. You've you got Bible apps for it, and you still don't read it. So some jackass gets on TV and makes statements, and, well, so-and-so said, did you ever read it? Yeah. Conclusion. Just wait till I get to last times. I'm going to make your hair curl. When, I'm closing now, okay? Gear down, trays up, seatbelts fastened, all right? When people are in a crisis, like a hospital bed, in jail, this is the book that's read, the Bible. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you, God, are with me. When a marriage dies, when hope gets lost, God's Word has power. God's Word is creative. There's life and death in the power of the tongue, and God says, let my Word be in your mouth. You meditate on it. When you speak it over your children, when you bless them, when you speak it over yourself, it has power. It's not Reader's Digest. It's, the Bible says it's quick or alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's an amazing thing, God's Word. It brings hope in times of despair, power in times of weakness, guidance in times of darkness. His Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's a story that gives your story and mine meaning. And if you knew the different acts through the Bible, you'd understand why we're in such a messed up spot, why we need a Savior, why we need a Redeemer to forgive us. 
It all started in Act chapter 1. But people say, well, Rick, it's not easy. Well, what in life is, that's deeply worthwhile and profoundly transforming is easy? Listen to it in your car. Whisper it to yourself. When you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, write down a part of it on a sticky note. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Get some kind of a program to read, a Bible app for a smartphone. But do whatever it takes to become some reasonable student of the Bible. Study it, meditate on it, memorize it, ask questions about what it says. And didn't Jesus, every time he got in a battle with the enemy, says, get behind me, Satan, for it is written. And he would quote the word of God. Well, my mother said, he never said that to anybody. Jesus didn't tell the devil. Well, my mother said, well, I heard him say in the media, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And it's called a sword. And it's your only offensive attack weapon. If I pray for you, if our team prays for you, I'm not praying nonsense. I'm praying God's word over you because it has healing power, delivering power, saving power. That's what we have been given. They didn't have that in Act 3. We get it in Act 5. The Bible says one day Jesus is coming back, that sin and death will finally be defeated forever, that one day this world will be made like it is supposed to be, radiantly and glorious new. And according to the Bible, that new story is going to be better, even better than the one we experience now. So God's Word is alive and it's powerful and it's not boring, but it's stupid if you just try to open the page like an owner's manual, you're not going to get it. If you get the fact that we need a Savior and a Redeemer and it's Jesus only, you won't be worried about whether it has fins or scales or whether it's the Sabbath day or whether you can mix flax and linen, which you couldn't. You, you, that was not about any of that. It all went to Jesus. He said, that's all fulfilled in me. You received me, and I've imputed to you as though you've kept the whole law. You could never keep it day in your life. So I, that's where grace comes in, grace alone. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself, not because you're morally pure or because you don't do anything wrong, but because of the grace of God that Jesus provided. You want to go back to the good old days under the law? Try that out. See how that works for you. Yeah, you, 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 you could die. They could kill you with stones if you broke the law. Nonsense. We live in the best part.